appreciate everyone dialing in. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of activity taking place over the past couple of, well, really the last 10 days has been a, a whirlwind for all of us. Um, it really started with the surge of interest from different manufacturers, academia, government, wanting to know how to get involved, how they could potentially provide some valuable input into this current crisis. Um, that really sparked our activity and desire to try to figure out how we can help use our position as the National Institute to try to coordinate activity. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about where we're at with things, um, give you a bit of an update on what we've been working through and try to leave uh, plenty of time at the end for questions. So Andy, if you can go to the next slide, please. So as a kind of high level overview of what we've been working on, we've, um, as I mentioned, a little more than 10 days ago, I'd say around two weeks ago, we, we started to realize there was a need for somebody to help coordinate activity within this space. Um, there was a tremendous amount of information out there, but there wasn't a lot of um, in where the truth was coming from or whether somebody should be going down a particular path or not. So we pretty quickly put our team together and then started working through some relationships with uh, government partners to try to better understand how to help navigate this space. So we've we put together a collaboration between the Food and Drug Administration, Veterans Affairs, and the National Institute of Health to try to help organize this space the best we can for the additive manufacturing community. And we'll, we'll talk some more about what we've done specifically in the next few minutes. Really the key here for us is trying to, to identify the place where additive manufacturing can make an impact. Uh, everyone wants to get involved and everyone's trying to do something to help out in this time of crisis, but really we would need to make sure we're, we're working on the right things and, and really trying to utilize our connections and our community to help um, address the specific issues we're at, or excuse me, make sense and, and where it makes sense for, you know, fighting uh, issues on the front lines, uh, specifically around PPE and things like that here initially. So um, the, in addition to that, you know, we're really looking to create some single source of truth so we can be talking to you know, everyone can confidently go to data and reference it and understand that they can move forward or, or not. Um, and, and really that that's speaks back to the connection that we've put in place with the FDA, the VA and NIH. And we'll, we'll elaborate on that quite a bit, uh, but they've been fantastic partners uh, in helping us get to this point. We're really trying to position ourselves as the collector of information and then parse that information off where it needs to go. So next slide, Andy. So, you know, might be thinking about why why is America makes getting in this? Um, there's lots of folks trying to do anything they can to try to to make a difference here, and and that is admirable for sure. And without a sense of direction, uh, it's certainly needed. Um, America makes positioned as one of the DoD Manufacturing Innovation Institute, specifically focused on additive manufacturing. We're in a perfect position to bring together uh, the community and, and really rally a particular problem. And we're seeing it from every you know, part of the community, whether it's small manufacturers, large manufacturers, you know, the entire um, supply chain associated with AM up through the research and development type organizations. You know, we're, we're really in a perfect position to bring the community together around a challenge. Honestly, this is probably like nothing else in our history provided a rallying point around why an institute makes sense to convene, coordinate, and catalyze a community to address a very specific problem. Obviously, in this case, that specific problem is, is trying to figure out how to deal with this COVID-19 um, pandemic, specifically around supply chain shortages. Where does a technology have the potential to make an impact? And how can we do something to try to coordinate that activity? 
So next slide, Andy. So kind of continuing on the purpose and really this is what we spent uh, the first few days really trying to think through what what is um, where do we best use our resources? How do we position the AM community in a place where we can actually go make a difference? Um, so, so really our energy focused on building this partnership with the government agencies that we mentioned and then creating a place where people can go to get information that they can trust and you know build it in a way that's easy to understand um you know we're, we're building a site uh, that site is active hopefully many of you have seen it uh, we've had a pretty significant number of manufacturers sign up for the site and you know the the straight excuse me the site is really positioned to try to streamline and communicate what the review process is for uploading designs, how to get yourself recognized as a manufacturer who wants to, uh, you know, create a, or to kind of make a difference as far as manufacturing components, as well as hosting specific needs that a individual point of use care facility might have. All of that is really built on the backbone that is, you know, utilizing 3D print designs, really using digital data to connect back to a single design that has been approved and then create the opportunity to make matches between the needs community uh, from the healthcare side and the manufacturing community, really creating you know, the supply chain, whether it's an interim solution um, for conventional manufacturing to catch up or it potentially is a long-term solution or very specific needs where additive makes sense. The, the purpose of the site is to build those connections, but to build it based on data that can be trusted and has been reviewed at some level so we can have confidence in what we're building. Next slide. So, so this slide, if you've been to our site, really summarizes what we're doing, how it works, um, it, it really is probably the simplest way or the, the single way to look at uh, where we're trying to position the Institute and, and how we think additive manufacturing can directly support uh, the current issue, you know, kind of supply chain shortages. So th this slide is uh, an overall summary of, of what we're doing. So if you if you read it from left to right, we're really trying to look at you know, three different uh, personas. So somebody that has a need. We, we can't forget this is ultimately all about the folks in the community, excuse me, that are out, you know, fighting um, those working on in healthcare, trying to keep the, the rest of the country safe. This is, this is their entry point for identifying their particular needs. Um, and then ultimately the, the tool is in place and really how we're scoping our role is to be able to connect those needs with those on the manufacturing side. So if you skip down to capabilities, that's really where those that can manufacture components are able to enter into the system. And then really at the core of all of it is the uh, box in the center there that calls out designs. And, and that really is the backbone that helps us create a opportunity to match those in the needs community with those in that have capabilities uh, within the community. All of that information is collected at America Makes. So we, we've built a site. Um, hopefully many of you have seen it. If not, it is, you know, you can very quickly get there by going to americamakes.us. Uh, we have a COVID-19 page. Um, if you click on the banner in the top, it'll take you directly to that. And this that really is the, the summary of all things that we're working on. It's a nice collection of work that our partners are doing. There's a tremendous amount of folks working in this space. We're really trying to, and I keep using this uh, analogy of, you know, become the big end of the funnel. We're trying to be the collection point for information and really the place where people can go first to understand, you know, information based on their various uh, persona types. Um, once you're in the site, then you will enter in and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the individual um, needs, designs and capabilities. But it really kicks off a workflow, those designs into uh, how our government partners are working and iterating through the, these designs. Um, and, and that's really the, the 
the key differentiator between what we're doing and you know, folks who are posting and working against designs that maybe haven't been reviewed at the right level. This is trying to take that guesswork out of it. And not that what others are, are doing isn't um, good. It's just we're trying to do this in a more coordinated manner. So we'll, we'll talk through a, a decision tree type format uh, here in a couple of slides. Uh, next slide. So you'll, you know, a, as folks enter data into the system, um, you know, just kind of a quick note on, on what are we doing with that data? Um, so really the data is, is used to make these connections, whether it's data collected on the manufacturing side, on the needs side, or as related to design, all of those pieces have to work together in order to make sure we're manufacturing the right components. And that, that's really the, the key um, takeaway from this is we want to make sure we're working on the right um, problem and the right parts at the right time and ultimately really in the right area. So, so that data as we collect it is our pathway to be able to leverage those reviewed designs and then make um, recommendations on connections through, through utilization of that data. Um, so next slide. So I'm going to take just a minute or two to talk through each of the different um, persona types. The first is healthcare providers. So as I mentioned, these are really the folks that are working on the front lines uh, or, or somewhere in the point of, of need um, spectrum. And what we're trying to do within this space is, is give folks in that community a place where they can come and submit their needs to a you know into one channel to get addressed and, and again we're, we're going through exercises right now of, of making sure we're scoping this in the right manner uh, we want to make sure that we, we understand what is inbounds and what is out of bounds additive manufacturing has the potential to make a significant impact here but we also have to understand what it's not going to do uh, so we're working through that making sure it's clear on the site for a healthcare provider to uh, really understand how to utilize this tool. Um, but ultimately, they can go into the system, submit their needs, and then they'll get entered into the workflow to try to uh, address their individual needs and connect it to somebody in the manufacturing community. Um, a couple of points of clarification for right now. The repository is not a marketplace. This is not something where we're going to be directly connecting um, need A with manufacturer B and having an actual transaction take place. Uh, what, we're, what we're really looking to do is leveraging these reviewed designs, get to the point where you can enter in a specific need and then you will be presented back with results. Admittedly, right now, that's going to be kind of a process outside of the, the tool, but very soon our workflows will be updated. So you will enter in a specific need and it will get to the point where we can return results to you. Ultimately, we know this is going to be a regional fight in most cases. And in, in cases where we're trying to bridge the shortfalls of the supply chain with additive manufacturing, we're wanting to make sure we're presenting data back to a someone with a need that is relevant. So we're, we're looking to immediately get to the point where we can say, these five manufacturers within 25 miles of your facility have identified themselves as being capable of producing this. Um, you know, where it gets into not being a repository is then that transaction, that interaction between POCs happens offline uh, the way it's currently structured and, and where we're at with it today. So that, that's how you would interact with the tool as a healthcare provider. Um, this will mature rapidly as we gain more and more information from both the providers, manufacturers, and the design community. We'll move towards a uh, dynamic connection where the needs are de identified based on a specific approved design or a category of designs. Um, that, that'll be an iteration that we'll be working towards. Uh, next slide. On the manufacturer side, when you go in, there, there's currently a form uh, that you will enter in your capabilities. It, it collects some basic information. Obviously, we're, we're trying to 
connect folks at a regional level. So we're able to do that uh, intelligently with data from you as a manufacturer. You know, we're really looking to, in the way the site is set up right now, manufacturers will go upload their information into the form and that information is then available to us on the back end um, in a repository that we're managing as the America makes team, uh, our folks in the government do have access to that as well. But this is not something that is currently a capability where you're going to be able to go and query um, the data to find out who can do what. It, it is currently a tool where you will input your capability and then we will be working on the matchmaking. Again, this is all, you know, rapidly changing um, day by day. This is becoming more and more mature. Um, Critical information, and this is something that you know when we first launched it, um, where we didn't have maybe enough information on what we were asking for. So we're going to constantly probably be going back to the community to update their profiles in some way, so that we're able to more more effectively match folks. Um, critical information needed around materials, so those materials that you can work with, um, different tools that you have, whether design tools, modeling. Um, as well as what your print capabilities and capacities are. Um, again, I'm talking um, more than I'd like to about what's coming, but the, the tool today is going to enable us to connect manufacturers and needs as that becomes more mature and more data gets put into it and we can put more intelligence into the algorithm. We can then get to the point where we're able to go off Query a particular design and we'll understand who from the manufacturing community is capable of printing specific designs and all of that will, you know, help speed up the process of the connection between healthcare providers and suppliers in the community. Um, so, so we'll be working through that initially. It's going to be a system where we're providing feedback via email uh, to make sure to initiate those connections. Uh, so that's where we're at today. And then we'll be updating and modifying as we become more mature in our data model. Next slide. The last space where you'll come into the system is as a designer. And this is really, honestly, I think one of the things that separates the effort and, and, and the work that's gone into our approach versus, you know, a more specific point solution on something. So we're really looking for designers to come to the site again, thinking of us as the large end of the funnel. We're collecting the information. You will come in and then be initiated immediately into a workflow where you'll enter some initial information and then you'll get redirected to the NI, uh, NIH 3D print exchange site. Um, that is really the, the, the back end of where all of the data, or excuse me, all of the design files are gonna be stored. So point of clarification, those are not stored on the America Makes website. Those are instead going to be stored on the NIH 3D print exchange. Um, that process, and we're, we're rapidly iterating on that, but the designs will get submitted and then they'll enter into the workflow that I'm about to, to walk through in, in some more detail. But a quick summary of it is they're going to go through this workflow and then they will be labeled according to kind of the level of review that they've received to date. Um, and, and it'll be easy to see and interact with. Ultimately, that is the data, however, that we're going to be using to do that connection between manufacturers and uh, the healthcare providers or you know the healthcare needs space so it's really critical that people that have designs and i'll stress this a few more times but we're really looking for folks who have designs and we know there's many out there specifically around some of the components that don't require um, fda approval and things like that or are covered under some guidance that's currently been released by the fda you know we really want folks to come to the system as a designer, enter in through America Makes, enter your information, and then you'll get pushed to NIH where you can actually upload your designs. That is the best place for the community at large to get access to information versus individual sites all over the country trying to do that. So we're it's fine that those exist and, and that's fantastic that they exist. 
we're really looking to centralize communication around this. So people, especially from the manufacturing community, know where to go to get a design that somebody has looked at at a clinician's level and agree that this is safe for use in a particular condition. So that's really you know, a, a key differentiator between what we're doing and how we're leveraging NIH to do that. Next slide, please. So I, I kind of just talked through this um, at a high level, really, you're, you're going to come in, submit a design uh, to us initially through America Makes, or you know, you'll start that process at America Makes, um, you'll get redirected to NIH, and then it'll kick off the review cycle uh, between VA, uh, and then be flagged accordingly at NIH, et cetera. So we'll, we'll jump in the next slide. All right, so, so this one is got a lot on it, I understand, but hopefully it will be yeah. an effective way of communicating the overall space to everyone. Um, so we've spent uh, basically the weekend really iterating on this with the different agencies. So if you enter into the system on the upper left-hand corner, enter a design, and keep in mind, this is really you know our ability to do this well will enable the connection on trusted components between the supply community and the needs community. So we're going to end upper left-hand corner, the uh, submit design to NIH. So you'll, you'll come in first to America Makes. We'll collect your information so we can keep those that information connected. Ultimately, you'll get directed to the NIH site where you'll walk through, you'll go in and share your model. Um, that model will be entered into the system as a um, under the classification of prototype. And then this balance of the workflow really talks through how we're going to be working together between FDA, NIH, and the VA in order to make that um, you know, review process effective. Um, so you'll go in, it, it will be flagged immediately as a prototype. And, and we're really looking for folks to bring designs to the table that have, you know, the more testing, the more clinic, more you've worked with doctors and nurses in your area and healthcare providers in your area, the easier this process will be. Uh, so that will take some of the burden off of the team uh, at the VA and those that are doing the evaluation. Uh, so the more information people can package when they do their design submission, the more effective and 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 our ability to expedite the process will improve dramatically. So ultimately that design will come in, they'll look at it, say, is this design feasible? Um, it might get kicked to the right and to that do not use flag. And if it does, it will be flagged as such in the on the NIH site. Um, that could mean that, you know, this is just, uh, you know, if there's some kind of critical failure in there um, and it should never proceed. You know, there's some workflows initiated where people will get notifications of that. Uh, in some cases, there may be some design iteration that you could do to move that back into the prototypes phase to be reevaluated. But you know, that we, we want to quickly parse out things that aren't worth continuing to look at. We we can't waste resources on making a mousetrap 37 different ways. If we get to the point where we have five to 10 components. The one we're really focused on right now is face shields. A lot of people have done work here. There's about 10 different designs right now that are um, being tested that are gonna very quickly get to the point where they're approved and move uh, to the, the phase that somebody can go pull the file down and print it. Um, that will help us align resources properly so that we can move on to the next most critical thing. So. Expecting that during the design feasibility diamond there, it is identified as yes. It will then move and you'll have, we'll ask the question, is FDA clearance required? And really this is an important step. And I think honestly, a step for many of us who aren't experts in the medical field, it helps us understand what level, who needs to actually review and approve this um, process. So if, if FDA clearance is not required, it will move directly into the phase of um, being reviewed by the VA for, or going through a clinical testing um, 
process. Um, if that is the case, so in so using some scenarios, think um, there is uh, like a face shield is, is the simplest example. You know, FDA clearance required for that? No, it is a class one uh, component. You do not need FDA clearance to um, manufacture those, so it immediately moves to no. We do want to make sure we're evaluating those things so that we're putting, you know, the best designs possible into someone's hands. So the, the VA is currently and has already reviewed a handful of different face shields. Um, if those get passed, then they get moved over to that, you know, the, the green category there, which really that, that does get broken down into two groups. So basically for something that doesn't require uh, FDA <laughs> guidance or clearance, and it is class one, it can either be used for, it's clinically reviewed, and it can be used in a hospital setting or clinically reviewed and can be used in a community setting. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so that's kind of one, one route. And many things will fall into this, um, the, the split off to the left there where it goes through VA clinical testing. Um, it, it's something I think that became much clearer for a lot of us over the past few days. The FDA, providing emergency use authorizations um, is going to be not, I guess that will not be the norm. Um, many components do not require that. Uh, we're working right now on trying to break this down into an easy to digest table so that you could look at it and say, this particular type of respiratory device does require an FDA EUA. So that will then take you down the path of, of yes. There are respiratory devices where a liquid barrier is not required. So more of a general use uh, respirator. So think, you know, folks in a grocery store or potentially police officer, something where it's better to have protection than not because you do interact with lots of folks, but you're not interacting with people of known risk. So the uh, liquid barrier is not required at that level, so it gets pushed into the category of VA clinically reviewed community use. Uh, so, so we're working on trying to establish a easy to understand table that goes along with this. So you can understand if you're talking about an N95 mask, which is a very specific type of mask, it has a different requirement than a respirator or a, or a mask that is to be used for community use. So we're, we're, we're trying to come up with a table that is associated directly with this, but um, that is to come here in the near term. If it does require a FDA EUA, then you'll go down and FDA gets um, uh, directly involved in that process. There is the opportunity, you know, those that are familiar with the EUA process and regularly work in this space with the FDA, you can enter in a design from uh, into NIH and, and go the more traditional FDA process, if you will. So there, there's FDA is still absolutely open uh, for business and very actively working in this space. This is just a workflow to try to, to coordinate data and organize, you know, the different designs against a particular uh, use case. So. That's the overall process that we're working for and the as things move from, you know, a step to the next step, they'll always be flagged. A particular rating, uh, if you can go to the next slide, Andy. So, so during the review process, the NIH site will maintain. Uh, variety of just different designations. Um, we're, we're putting the specific language a little hard to read on a slide. So NIH site has specific language associated with, with each of these um, slides. So it, it's easier to understand uh, when and how they're utilized and, and what that means to you as either a manufacturer, um, someone with a particular need. Ultimately, the more effective we are at gathering information aligned to these different designations and following that workflow on the previous slide, you know, that will be the only thing that will enable a, you know, an appropriate match of needs and uh, 
um, supplier capabilities. So, so that's what we've been working uh, over the past, you know, 10 days, two weeks on. Made lots of progress in the last couple of weeks. We've got a lot of uh, folks redirecting people to our site. We have at this point, I don't know the number, but a couple hundred plus manufacturers who have input their initial information, I'll say. So that's been pretty successful. Um, we've not yet got a tremendous push from the needs community. I think the more we're able to point back to specific designs and the, the better we're able to do that, we'll be uh, more effective at, at our connection. So go to the next slide is kind of the where to find information. Um, and then I think we're gonna just open it up for questions uh, for the, the balance of the time. So if you have specific questions, you can email the email address, COVID-19 at americamegs.us. We are pushing out uh, regular updates. There's a mailing list that you can join. Um, the most up-to-date information is on our website and we're actively uh, updating links and connecting to different sites and, and working with our partners who are making resources available, trying to, again, be the, the collection point for information. If there are specific media requests, um, Please reach out to Andy and he can help process those. We really want to make sure we're we're talking about this as a community, making sure people understand and manage expectations properly, but most importantly, that we're working on the right thing. So we'd be very interested in talking to folks about how to do that more effectively. But that's that's really what we've been working on for the last couple of weeks. Andy, any uh, questions we want to dig into? Sure. Uh, we actually have a lot of a lot of questions. So um let me just say I'm I'm going to try to paraphrase the questions because there's a lot of very similar questions on here. If we don't get to everybody's questions today, uh, we will respond to you individually throughout the week uh, with certain questions. Um, but I do there are a lot of questions about where to find the recording of this. Uh, following the completion of the webinar, what we'll do is we'll post it on the resource section of the uh, repository site. Uh, there will be a link there, and then we'll also send an email out to everybody uh, with the link and post it on our social media channels as well. Um, John, one of the questions that we are getting um, a lot on here is a question about liability. Uh, what happens if the parts uh, is the manufacturer liable for that? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best at answering that. Um, you know, we, we've we've honestly enlisted a couple of, of legal groups to try to help us get good answers to that. And it's, I, I actually consolidated a series of 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 the top five legal and regulatory questions. As we get responses back from that, we will certainly share those and make them available. It's honestly the reason that we have made the connections with the VA and FDA and NIH, uh, but really having the VA serve as that reviewer of information is, is, is going to help us with that. Um, I will say, there are a lot of caveats on these different things uh, in that when you do enter into a specific contract with somebody, um, you know, it, it's ultimately still going to be up to the person manufacturing and person procuring it. That's why we want to make sure, you know, one of the things that I, I missed saying on the healthcare provider um, slide was we're really looking for the folks from the procurement team within hospitals and, and those types of places to be the one interacting with the site, those that can intelligently and you know adequately work with the community to get things purchased. Um, so I think that will be, you know, that will be helpful. Um, but there's certainly a risk, and it, it depends on you know individual clinicians' um, acceptance of that or not. So there's there are, you know, some realities that we're having to deal with. Hopefully, there is well, there is certainly value in, in processing things the way we are to help take some of that risk away. I will say one other uh, item that I, I didn't say when I went through the different uh, the flow chart there. For many of the components we're talking about, and this is the, this matrix, uh, risk matrix that I mentioned earlier is going to become very important. We just need to get some more clarification on risk levels and kind of the rule set, but once we have that, we'll be able to more effectively answer that question. There's been a series of different guidance documents that have come out uh, from the FDA. 
we're going to start linking to those um, just so again they're they're available there is an faq that the fda put out recently that's got really good information faq specifically around 3d printing um components they have an overall uh, uh guidance document on um that they put out in 2017 that actually speaks um with more detail to additive manufacturing for um, medical devices. So that is a reference. I believe that's up on our site right now as well. But one of the key things is as you or move up that risk scale, there are very specific expectations around uh, a manufacturer who is providing a good to have a quality management system in place. So they call it um, you, you're required to have GMP, which it stands for Good Manufacturing Practices. Um, typically, that means that you meet the ISO uh, standard for medical. They have, per guidance, relax that. Uh, well, I don't know the official term there, but they're, if you have a quality management system, so think, you know, ISO 9000, those, those types of things, um, making sure you're, the manufacturer understands how to manufacture goods is, is really the key. So um, th that's going to come into the decision about whether to buy from manufacturer A versus Z. And it, it certainly depends on the type of component we're talking about. Um, so hopefully we're a step closer to this risk matrix, but it's not um, yet ready to put out. Uh, so hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll have an agreement on what that is and we'll make sure everyone sees that. It's a long-winded answer to it depends, um, but th those are the things in the way that we're currently addressing that problem. Uh, John, I, this is kind of a two-part question. One, is the site um, able to be used by, um, by folks not uh, doing additive manufacturing or, or 3D printing? And then as part of that, um, as part of it, can it be assumed that um, Folks who are not a large manufacturer who might have some printers at, say, a school or a tech center, are they able to use the site as well? Yeah. So, so the first part of the question, we're, we're really primarily focused on additive manufacturing here. Um, we we certainly recognize a lot of other folks are interested in simple spaces, but maybe more broadly, um, you know, I would I would say it is. A little bit more open than just AM because I think there's a lot of ways that additive can supplement conventional manufacturing, um, most specifically around tooling and rapid uh, turnover of tooling and things like that. So it kind of depends on your definition of of additive, uh, but primarily we are talking about additive manufacturing. We do have a place where we, you can connect, collect other capabilities that you have. I can see as our risk matrix becomes more defined and we are able to check things off, meaning face shields for everyone's awareness are pretty close, I think, in everyone's eyes of saying, we've got enough face shields at this point. There are a, num a pretty significant number of approved designs. So we don't need to keep designing face shields. Uh, we have most AM, I think all AM processes covered by something that has either been approved or is in review right now. Um, that puts us in a good position to have a diverse population meeting the need. Um, so that that is primarily a um, uh, to answer the second part of the question. Really, anyone can engage. It depends on what kind of parts you're wanting to manufacture. So the the key really comes back to this: it, is this GMP good manufacturing practice required? Um, I think as soon as we get this matrix, we'll be able to more directly point someone in a direction than we can today. Um, the, the simple answer to that question is, if your hospital needs face shield and you pull down one of the designs and it currently falls into the category of FDA approval is not required and it's a class one um, device, then you could manufacture those for your hospital as a school, et cetera, you know, how you get set up with process and contracting or any of that, you know, that's currently outside of what we're um, involved in. We're really trying to be um, the the matchmaker in from that point of view.
Uh, John, there's a couple of questions on here in terms of the designs that will be uh, on the NIH exchange. Will they have additional information um, or just the the assigned label or designation? So, will they have any test data or any instructions that will be listed with them on the site, or will it just be the the design blueprint and the respective de designation? Yeah, no, that perfect, perfect question. <laughs> Another thing that's been rapidly iterated on over the past couple of days, we, we all understand, especially those that are, are used to make making components um, for regulated industries, that um, technical data is critical to be able to reproduce a component <laughs> repeatedly and with confidence. Um, so the more data someone can put in when they submit a design, um, as I mentioned, the, the faster it can work through the process, as well as you know, we're the, the couple of designs that are going up today that the VA has went through. Uh, I know there's a face shield, and I believe there is a mask for um, that would be in the same category as a surgical mask uh, that the VA has tested. They're going to make uh, quite a bit of data available and information available. Um, we're, we're asking people to upload build files, things to make the process as seamless as possible for someone to actually manufacture a, a component and repeat that manufacturing. They're actually producing um, a document that goes along with each of them, which is intended uh, IFUs, they call them, intended for use documents which really talks you through the process of this particular face shield. This is how you use it. This is how you have to clean it. Are they intended for single use or um, you know, multiple uses? So that information will be covered in these IFUs. Um, that, that is not necessarily going to be on every single file that is uploaded into the system. Obviously our goal to get closer to that will, you know, it would be the best case scenario for everybody. Um, they're going to kind of serve as um, best practice uh, to get us started as we start getting more and more designs into the system. And the design community and the test community is very interested in helping here too. We just have not had the rules for them to follow. So hoping that as that becomes more clear, we'll be able to get more information loaded. And, and I'll tell you, and it, it references it, you know, not so specifically in the slides, but if somebody uploads a file and there's nothing with it and it's just an STL, and then somebody at the same time submits a file with you know test data and a testimonial from a clinician as well as build files and anything you could need in a write-up, you know that's going to get looked at. The one that's just got you know. Uh, individual's name at gmail.com is just can't be processed. There's too many things to do. So we need to be as thorough in our submission of information as possible. A couple questions on specific um, uh, healthcare need related questions. One, um, how is it going to work in terms of manufacturers of being able to view these specific needs of healthcare providers? Um, two, uh, I guess a little more in detail on that. How will the matching actually work? And then three, um, how or who at actual hospitals and healthcare providers can plug into the system? So, first question initially, the needs will not be openly um, visible to the community, um, the manufacturing community. Uh, again, I think this is all going to rapidly um, change as we're working through this and, and how we do that and who can query the information and who cannot. But right now, they will put them in there. They get put into a queue, a workflow within our organization and they get processed um, by our organization. Um, that matching is currently a process of querying a need against the capabilities that have been collected in the back end or connected in the in the supplier side. Um, we're moving to have a, I think it's by the end of today, updated forms for designer, um, manufacturer or supplier and healthcare need. Uh, so there'll be an update to the actual form that will get us a step closer to 
dynamically matching and presenting results back. So in the near term, um, I, I won't quote the number of days or week, um, but we'll, we're wanting to move towards a system where it'll actually be something where these, a healthcare, um, someone with a need will go into the system and actually enter their information in and be presented um, with results. Um, we're not currently sure how quickly we can do that. It's gonna be dependent on how um, thorough our data is that we've been able to collect from folks. So that, that's where we're at, where we're going. Um, the third question around who can enter it in, we're really looking for folks who understand the needs of their facility to be the one entering it in. Um, so whether that is actually somebody in the acquisition space, procurement space, um, I, ideally it's someone who is, I mean, what we're really looking for is someone who can make a purchase decision. Um, we certainly are interested in knowing demand signals uh, from as wide a variety of places as possible so we can activate the community properly, but it, it, it can't be something where, you know, someone in the, hospital that doesn't really have a true picture of what's going on is entering items in and saying, I need 10,000 of this, or I heard such and such is going to happen. We're really looking for folks who are um, responsible for the um, purchase and use of components to be the ones interacting with the system. And we'll be moving, you know, as we now are collecting more and more information on the supplier side, we'll be starting a more of an outreach campaign to folks in the needs community to make sure they really understand it. That is admittedly a space that we, you know, that's not a space we normally interact in. So we'll be working through other uh, associations and things like that to try to get us best connected to the right people. Um, we're also working with, you know, folks in FEMA and things like that, trying to understand the regional needs uh, based on the, the way the task force has been broken down. So we're, you know, still working to get. Uh, more accurate information on the demand signal and what is needed, you know, today, five days, you know, five weeks from now across a variety of different parts. Uh, John, just to uh, just to reiterate, these designs, once they get placed on the NIH exchange, will be publicly available, correct? Correct. That is the case. These These are designs that are intended for use where people can reproduce them and, and share them. And then do we have any guidance on a preferred uh, platform or file format for submission? Uh, we'll, we'll make sure we answer that in the Q&A. Um, I know we, we've been going back and forth with NIH, making sure that they were able to um, collect as wide a variety of file type as possible. I will, I will reach out to them to make sure we can get an answer to that. I know we can collect a pretty diverse um, set of file types. Uh, if there is a preference or not, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. So I will find out and make sure everyone knows. And then uh, we've gotten a couple of questions on the finance and, and contracting side of this. I know there were specific decisions made to, you know, for this repository to really just focus on being an information exchange. Can you kind of just go over that a little bit more? Yep. Yeah, so, so, so right now we're really focusing on the you know, matchmaker analogy of connecting those with needs with those with a capability. There are some sites out there, some different services that exist that function quite well in, in that capacity of, of actually initiating contracts. Uh, we have been talking with folks in the Commerce Department trying to better understand what resources are available there. How do we utilize them? Potentially, how do we utilize them at a national level? to help support our ability to do this matchmaking. Um, so we're, 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 I'll say early in those discussions, but we're, we're talking through some of those different scenarios. Um, there are, you know, avenues through different government programs to do some of this. Um, we'll, we hope to make some of those resources more available and widely known as we really truly understand how to use them more effectively. Um, there are, uh, as you, I think everyone knows, um, there's more and more folks getting engaged in this. We've, we've had a tremendous amount of support and outreach from 
different communities, different government agencies, uh, from the White House being very engaged in understanding what we're doing to the Department of Defense, initiating different task force, task forces. Um, you'll start to see, I think, over the next few days, more and more information about that. Some of those have the potential to um, help support contracting, um, help initiate um, actual procurement, specifically around some of the more complex um, components that we're talking about. So as we move up the risk scale and start to talk about um, need for ventilators, need for um, you know, auxiliary ventilator type, um, different ventilator components and things of that nature, um, there is some um, activity going on within the government. We're, we're staying connected to it. That can get us to the point where we're able to we may not necessarily be the one doing the contracting, but we can, we'll be able to be more effective at connecting those things. But as of right now, our stance I'll say is we're not in the position where I can say hospital has a need for 5,000 of X. We want to disperse that manufacturing to five different manufacturers, each manufacturing 1,000 of X. Um, that it, we're gonna connect them to those five and tell them to, reach out directly to this person, here's their capabilities. And, and at this point, that is that is our role, um, really trying to be the, the trusted agent to bring all of those pieces together, um, but not actually initiating contracts. However, there are there is some efforts going on around us that we potentially can take advantage of uh, in coming days, week, weeks. Sure. Um, we've got about, um, about seven minutes left on the webinar. Um, so probably time for, for one more question. But if you guys have questions and we haven't gotten to them, please submit them through the Q&A portal uh, on the webinar. And we will make sure that uh, we send around a follow-up email addressing as many of those questions as we can. Um, I think to uh, maybe a good way to close this up and this kind of follows on some of the questions we've gotten about folks who want to help beyond additive manufacturing, we're part of the Manufacturing USA network. Um, and there are a lot of good things happening across that network. Do you mind just take a couple minutes just to talk about what's happening throughout the Manufacturing USA institutes? Um, no, that, 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 that's perfect. There is um, a tremendous amount of activity. It's really how it started for us a couple of weeks ago. There, there was a lot of folks running in a lot of different directions. Um, we, we've talked to a number of the different institutes. We all have our you know, pretty specific swim lanes uh, that we operate in, but there is plenty of overlap. Um, we're, we're trying to get as coordinated as we can. Uh, I, I really started off talking about, now this really feels like why the institutes were founded and, and set up in the first place to be able to react to a crisis, um, whatever it might be. You know, we'd always, I think, thought about this as a national defense um, related activity or, or filling a particular gap or a new emerging technology. Um, you know, we're, we're now seeing the power of being able to convene the community together and coordinate them to take a direct and specific action around a technology. For us, obviously, it is additive manufacturing, but, you know, we're, we're seeing, I mean, if if, if it's just this webinar, hundreds and hundreds of people coming together, trying to figure out how they can help support a particular cause, you know, but, you know, we were on a call with all of the institutes probably a week and a half ago. And one of the folks from arm mentioned you know, there, there is just a lack of coordination at a, you know, national level right now in this space. At that point, we we've met multiple times since then. I think we're really um, have started to understand who's doing what, trying not to trip over each other um, because there's a lot going on for sure. Um, so so we're trying to work more effectively together. You know, pass things off to folks who you know it better aligns to their specific swim lane. Work together where it makes sense uh, to take advantage of other communities. We certainly don't know it all. And we hopefully are not coming across or pretending that we do. Um, we're really trying to collaborate with as many folks as we can. It's just seen for us as a big need, lack of coordination in this space. So that really what drove us to get to this point. It all started about a week and a half ago. I sent a letter to the FDA calling out for 
very specific gaps, one around lack of demand signal, lack of a repository, no guidance from regulatory bodies on what we need to know from design material and IP uh, related um, spaces, and finally, distribution system to connect all those pieces together. That immediately launched a tremendous amount of activity on our side and within uh, the, all the agencies that we're working with. I think we've seen um, the government respond and react and come out with guidances and alternate approaches very quickly. So it's been a very interesting time. Uh, the more effective we are at talking as a voice to them, I think the more effective we'll be at getting things bought off and, and, and to the point where we can actually start supporting directly a particular need. So it's been a crazy uh, week and a half, but it's been a really reoccur or, uh, encouraging about how well the community has come together. Um, nobody's trying to, to, to plant a flag anywhere specifically, but they're all trying to just make sure we're doing the right thing. So. Yep. Certainly appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I know it's not easy, especially now to take time. Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of what we're doing. Um, very interested in, in trying to work together. I will say we really encourage people to come to the site and log in as and, and register as one of those types, whether you're a manufacturer, uh, someone from the needs community or someone from the design community. Get yourself and profiles established so we have them, we understand who you are, what your organization's capability is, um, and, and really the role that you wanna play in this movement. That's gonna help us do everything we're trying to do more effectively. And then we can't forget that this is really dependent on the NIH site and people uploading their information with as much information as possible to that site so that ultimately it can go into the workflow, get reviewed, get evaluated per the protocol, and then get designated in a way that people can, with trust, use a particular design, ultimately getting us to the point where we can serve the community better. So certainly encourage everyone to go out and use that site, come through us, you'll get redirected to them, but it really is the backbone of this all working, making sure we're working on the right designs, whether it's for a face shield, whether it's for a community use mask or, you know, we wanna make sure this information is as coordinated as possible when we're doing this. So appreciate everyone's time and, uh, and, and support in this effort. All right, thank you, John. Uh, that's gonna be it for today. And just if I uh, can remind everybody, cause we still have some questions on that coming in. Um, the recording will be made available on the repository site under the resource section. Uh, we'll also be pushing that out on our social media channels. Um, we do have an FAQ document under the resource section on the repository site. Uh, that is That was uploaded over the weekend. That will continue to be updated. And I think there are some great questions that we've seen from today that we'll, we'll obviously be putting those on uh, that document throughout the week. Uh, keep checking back on the site for updates. And, and as always, feel free to reach out with any specific questions. So thank you very much, everybody.